My son and I are home coffee roasters, and this weekend we roasted over 40 kilos of coffee. That's a lot of coffee on this 500 gram roaster. That's a lot of roasts. And I wanna share that experience with you today. I wanna to show you the profile that we ended up with uh, in using, and I wanna do a roast here at the Virtual Coffee Lab. So stick around. All right, welcome to the Virtual Coffee Lab. Thanks for joining me today. On my previous video, I shared my experience getting a pretty big gig for roasting coffee for a nonprofit. Uh, my son and I didn't make any money doing this. It was a gift or free of charge, our services, and it was a great experience. We got a lot of time behind the roaster. We got a lot of coffee to roast. And so today I want to do the roast profile that we landed on and it is a delicious coffee. It ended up being sweet and uh, a little bit juicy. So it was not a acid bomb, it was not a, a giant fruit bomb, uh, but it was a coffee that really highlighted a Papua New Guinea coffee. So we get a little bit of that rustic kind of a vibe going on with the Papua New Guinea. We got some of that sweetness and there's kind of a, a milk chocolate that's in this roast along with a cherry note that smells spectacular and it tastes really good. So this is the coffee that we sent out to all of the different people within this nonprofit that they wanted to have this coffee experience. And we're going to take a close look at the profile. But before I do that, I wanted to remind you that in future videos, we're gonna be taking this Papua New Guinea coffee, we're gonna be roasting it on the hive, on the bee bore, on the fresh roast, and possibly even the popper. We're gonna to try to use this uh, same profile or a similar, very close profile to what we're doing here, and we're gonna translate that to each of the different roasters that we use. So that's gonna be a lot of fun for some upcoming videos. So hang around for that. Subscribe to my channel, hit that bell icon to be alerted so that you'll see these videos uh, you'll be notified of these videos when they come out. All right, so now I wanna talk about the profile. I'm gonna show a profile here on the screen that is more or less what we stuck with for all of our roasts. First, let's talk about the total roast time. The roast ended up being uh, anywhere from 10 minutes to 10 minutes and 30 seconds. A lot of the time it was about 10 minutes and 15 seconds. We had some variation in our total roast time, but our target was about 10 minutes and 15 seconds. We had a first crack target time of eight minutes and 30 seconds. And so the overall profile ended up being about a 51% dry phase, like a 31%, sometimes a little longer, 32%, um, maybe even sometimes 33% middle phase. And then about a, anywhere from a 15 to 17% development. Uh, percentage for the roasts. We tried to be as consistent as we could with our roasts and we ended up getting a really interesting um, kind of a between batch protocol is what they call it. So basically what do we do as soon as the roast drops, what do we do with the roaster itself to prepare it for the next roast? Remember we're going roast after roast after roast and we don't have all day to try to change all of these different settings and increase the heat, de decrease the heat. So we had to figure out a way to be able to use the roaster and then prepare it quickly for the next roast so that we could have consistency every time. So what I mean by consistency is the same charge temperature, a very similar um, exhaust temperature each time we started the roast so that our turnaround or our turning point would be the same for each roast. Our dry phase would be really close for each roast and each of the settings that we have. So in each phase we have different settings that we've marked down and we followed those and we got a fairly consistent roast. We had to do some finagling because we were doing something special with this profile. And that's what I wanna talk about now is what we did to be able to accomplish 
a roast that looks like this. And so here are the beans. You can look at the color on these. There's consistency. Uh, you'll notice that these beans are not shiny. They are not really super swelled. Uh, so that's because we're taking this roast into first crack, but not too long into first crack. We're going for about a minute and a half to a minute and 45 seconds worth of development time for uh, for this coffee. And what that ended up with was a range, a temperature range, anywhere from 397 on the high side of 397 to 399 degrees. In that range is where we wanted to drop the coffee. The end temperature has a huge impact on the flavor of the coffee. How much roastiness there is, how much origin flavor you've left in the coffee. And that all depends on the end drop temperature. And of course, all the other things in between are going to influence flavor. How long you are going to be in this middle phase, that will have a huge difference. If you've got any significant um, rate of rise crashes during the roast, that can influence the flavor. Uh, and how much air you use. We haven't really talked too much about air. I've got a couple videos on air here on my channel. But we used a three-step um, for the um, air control for this. That means we started out with more or less a slight draw on the roaster, slight airflow. And then when we got close to dry, we stepped it up and had a medium airflow. And then when we started approaching first crack, we ended up working with a, a fairly high airflow. Uh, and that helped us uh, in a couple of ways. It helped us get our rate of rise to slow down. And it helped us kind of control our way uh, to a lower rate of rise that allowed us to be able to stretch out our development time. If, if we wouldn't have done that, we would have flown through the development phase. So, so we'll talk about that while we're roasting the coffee, but you can take a look at the graph here and see that the rate of rise ends up taking a, um, a fairly steep descent before first crack. And that is because we want to be at a certain rate of rise when first crack starts and descending so that we have a slow rolling crack moving through the development phase which gives us a minute and a half to be able to allow the coffee to um, develop without having a really high end temperature. So there are people that have asked me, hey Mike, how do you do a, like a light roast coffee? Um, Technically, our coffee is a medium roast. It's on the lighter side of medium. But this is one method to do that, is to bring your rate of rise down. Uh, just start getting it down. So like at first crack, our rate of rise, our target was to be around 12. Um, so we didn't want it to be anything above that because it would have been too hard to get it to get lower so that it would slow the roast development down and give us more time to be able to uh, leave that coffee in, in that phase. We didn't want to have a flat rate of rise, so you'll see that it's constantly descending, um, but it slows down once we get into the development. Uh, it, it slows down a little bit uh, so that we have this extended period of time. So this might not be the perfect looking rate of rise that has this uh, nice even descent. Ours kind of goes uh, kind of a shallow descent and then it drops and we had to do that. That was the only way that we could get the percentages we want and the development time. I'm sure there's other uh, ways to do that. Again, I'm not an expert uh, with this, uh, but in my experience this has been one way to be able to extend your development time without over roasting your coffee. Uh, and not baking it either. You know, you don't want to have a flat rate of rise and just have the coffee drag out and you lose um, all of that, um, all the flavor development you've worked for. All right, so that is the profile. And so now I want to talk to you about between batch protocol. So what we ended up doing was as soon as the coffee dropped out of the roaster, we left the air where it was on high 
We left the door open that allows the coffee out. We left that door open till it reached a certain temperature. And it was like 355 degrees. And then we closed the door. That gave us about a minute to be able to, about a minute or a minute and a half to be able to, um, and we left the burner on. We left the burner on, I think it was at 0.5 uh, on the KPA gauge. And we let that slowly um, warm up. We let the exhaust temperature build up so that by the time we uh, looked at the roast analysis, saved the file, and then adjusted our air to re, you know, just to get the air down to that initial minimum draw step, we were about 20 or 30 seconds away from charging the roaster. So there was really about two minutes between, maybe two and a half minutes between each roast, and then we would be ready for the next roast. So I've roasted this coffee for you here just before the video. I've got a complete roast and I'm gonna narrate it. This is roast number 92 of the PNG coffee, and we're gonna start right at charge. All right, the roaster was charged at 384 degrees. It's about a degree lighter or cooler than we would normally charge it, but a degree isn't gonna be a critical error at all. We can easily make that up based on how long we let the coffee soak. You'll notice that this coffee, the exhaust temperature right now is what we gauge on when we turn on the energy. We're gonna let that drop to 375 degrees, and then we're gonna give it uh, full power. It's actually about 85, 90% power on our roaster here, and that is going to display as a bend to the right and then an upward trend with the exhaust temperature. You can see that happening here, and it takes a little while for that energy to be able to work its way up because we've got cool, 500 grams of cool PNG Papua New Guinea coffee that was just put in the roaster. All right, so between now and uh, dry end, it's you know, gonna be kind of just wait and see. We'll see some temperatures and things like that, but I've got a couple minutes where I wanna take this time to share with you how we managed all of the coffee that we're roasting. So briefly, we didn't just roast a batch of coffee and then bag that batch of coffee. We roasted 20 roasts, maybe more, and we would put that into a five gallon bucket. This five gallon bucket would hold all of this coffee and we would mix it up. But during that time, we wanted to keep it as fresh as possible. And so we use a product from Airscape. It's a five gallon lid. Um, it's an Airscape lid, plunger lid, that we used to be able to keep the coffee fresh. Um, for larger shops, it has a port where you can inject nitrogen, and that helps for longevity and keeping coffee fresh. We didn't do that because the coffee was going to be bagged that same day. We just kept it sealed with the Airscape lid itself. So here's the five gallon bucket. It's a food safe bucket. We didn't even really have to keep the outer lid of the bucket on. The Airscape uh, plunger um, is airtight and it keeps the coffee fresh and we would just lay the lid on top. So I would highly recommend this product. We picked this up at Roast Fest in Chicago last summer, saw it there and it is a, a really cool product. We knew we wanted to have something like this to be able to mix our coffee in and to keep it fresh. The bucket is sold separately. You can get it on Amazon, food safe bucket, and the uh, Airscape lid itself for this large bucket. It will be in the description. There'll be a link there. All right, let's get back to the roast. All right, we are still climbing towards dry end. You can see turning point is one minute and 33 seconds and a temperature of 270.5 degrees. That is an indication of where I'm at in my um, my target for about a 515 dry. So we want to have this coffee to a dry phase between five minutes and 530, but most likely our, our goal is like a five minute and 15 second dry phase. And based on that uh, result, whatever that target result is, we make adjustments. But the turning point gives me an idea of how far ahead or behind 
I will be on my target. How do I know that? Based on all of the roasts we've been doing, it, it reoccurs and it's within a degree or two and within a few seconds that I know that I'm on target at my turning point to reach my target at dry end. Okay, about one minute before dry end, we take the uh, very little draw, the almost neutral to minimal draw on the airflow, and we turn that airflow up. So on my roaster, it goes from about 31 or so, and I turn it up to about 42 on my dial. That is a medium draw, and that is going to help use this heat that I have, this exhaust temperature that I have, and it's going to start really moving some hot air around in the drum. That is going to help speed up the roast process a little bit and prepare me for my uh, my top rate of rise temperatures and then start my decline on my exhaust uh, and my um, rate of rise. Dry end took place at 5 minutes and 12 seconds. You can see the temperature there, 300, 355.8 degrees. And so now the exhaust temperature is going to continue to climb a little more. I want to get this exhaust temperature about 10 degrees above where my drop temperature target is going to be. So I'm going to be anywhere between 309 and 312 degrees is the range that I want my uh, exhaust temperature to float along the way here for a little bit before I start to back down my heat. One of the things that I do once I reach dry end is I start to make a few incremental adjustments to my heat. I'm lowering it just a little bit and that's going to take that exhaust temperature which is pointing upward and it's going to start to slowly uh, bring its way down to a level position and that's what I'm doing now. 408 degrees is about where I'm landing here with my exhaust temperature. That's going to float up a little bit more and that's fine because I'm going to ride this along and keep that uh, heat going until I get to about a minute before first crack and then I'm going to start to make some adjustments to my heat to bring that rate of rise down even more. Just because of these adjustments that I'm making now, the rate of rise will start to descend and we talked about this earlier in the video, I'm going to have a gradual descent downward towards first crack. Okay, so we're almost a minute before first crack is going to take place, and I'm going to be increasing my airflow from 42 to 50. That's going to help bring my exhaust temperature down a little bit, uh, and that's going to start to uh, slow down the increase in the heat in the temperature of the drum which is still climbing but we're going to have it climb at a lower rate so our rate of rise which is around 20 is going to go down just before first crack I want it to be around 12 that's my target so I need to lose about 8 degrees of rate of the rate of rise I need to lose that on its way down and we're doing that by increasing the air and I'm also after I do that I'm going to start adjusting temperatures because I want to avoid the flick which is a high uh, jump in the rate of rise just before first crack I'm trying to avoid that I've got a little bit of that going on here in this roast and then around eight minutes around 8 minutes and 30 seconds I'm expecting first crack to take place which is almost here and there it is first crack so one of the things you'll notice is I've already started to lower my rate of rise my exhaust temperature you can see is on the decline and I'm bringing it fairly close to the bean temperature depending upon the roast uh, sometimes I'll be a little above or a little below my bean temperature with my exhaust. Uh, and that's because, um, I mean, that's all about heat management, but there's a lot going on with the beans going exothermic. They're giving off heat, and uh, so I can lower my gas. I actually have to lower my gas, or I will see these large jumps in my rate of rise. So I'm backing down the gas. You can see that taking place here. Look how low it is. It's only like 
to KPA. And then I'm going to start to finagle my gas, bringing it back up to uh, compensate so that I don't have a large crash in my rate of rise. Remember, this is the section in development where I want to have a little steeper decline in my rate of rise to go from that 12, I got the first crack rolling, and now I want to get that rate of rise to continue to drop down. And I'm in the fun zone, I'm below 10, and it's going to be uh, down to as low as 4 right when I do the drop. All right, so I am managing my gas. I'm getting close to um, dropping this coffee. The cooling fan is on, and now I'm going to start sniffing the coffee. I want to make sure that I'm on track. It smells good, and now I'm going to drop the coffee. That's exactly what I wanted to have happen. This roast performed basically like all the other roasts did. I think we only had, out of all of these roasts, we only had a couple that uh, well one for sure we didn't use there were two two roasts we did not use out of all of these roasts they were within our parameters so we were really happy about that there wasn't a lot of waste we actually gave that coffee away to some friends and um, and we enjoyed it during the week to drink so yeah that's that's what you do with roasts that don't turn out exactly like you want them to you still share them anyway uh, they don't taste bad they're just not exactly where you want them in your roast profile okay so that is the roast this coffee is a delicious coffee just a pleasant really uh, a great coffee to have in the morning it's a full body coffee uh, really enjoyable so this is a learning experience for us I was able to replicate this roast for you because we've done it so many times and that's a tip for you guys if you want to be able to get consistent in your roasts you order the same coffee and you roast it over and over and you practice with that roast. Then when you move on to the next coffee and you do the same, let's say you go from a Papua New Guinea coffee like this to an African coffee, you're going to want to go through the process of finding the right profile, maybe something that highlights the fruitiness of that coffee even more. It may be a lighter bodied coffee. You might want to roast it a certain way because of a brew method you're using. Uh, all of that are things to consider, uh, but getting behind the roaster and going through this process with a, a coffee like the Papua New Guinea, buying a lot of that coffee and then practicing is going to help make you a better roaster. It helped us uh, improve our roasting skills as well. One of the fun aspects of this project was is that my family was involved in it. We had our family packaging the coffee, um, you know, bagging it, sealing it, and boxing it, making the boxes, putting the labels on, all of that. And my son and I did the roasting and of the work. And that was a lot of roasting, probably the most roasting. Well, it was the most roasting I've ever done within that short period of time. And it was a great learning experience. If you're interested in learning more about this roast, check out the comments that people leave and the questions that they have. I respond to them. Other people have responded to some of the comments as well. And that is a learning resource for you here on my channel at the Virtual Coffee Lab. If you have questions about the things that I did in this roast, ask away and I'll be more than happy to answer those. If you have roasted and you've done something like this with your rate of rise, uh, where you have had it drop off a little more than uh, what you were doing earlier during the middle phase, and you did that to lengthen your development a little bit to keep your temperatures lower, share that, share why you did that, tell me the type of coffee you were using, I'd be interested in hearing that. And if you've never done this before, try that method and see what happens with your roast and then share your feedback. The one thing you don't want to do is let your rate of rise crash. You don't want your rate of rise to just drop straight down. That's not good. That is not going to help you with your roast. But you want that to be able to ride along so that you can uh, keep your temperatures low uh, and be able to have that time in development. Our goal in development was a minute and a half to two minutes and you can see that we were about a minute and what were we? We were a minute and 45 seconds almost in our development time. So all right, if you have questions, leave those in the comments. If you like what you saw in this video, hit the like button. If you have not subscribed to my channel, please do that. That really helps me out and it helps us show up more on YouTube for other home coffee roasters. 
Next video, I'm not sure which roaster we're going to have, but we're going to do the Papua New Guinea again. We're going to talk about uh, the roasting profile and roast that coffee. And I look forward to seeing you when we do that the next time here at the Virtual Coffee Lab. I hope you have a great week roasting. See you next time.